Uh, excellent. Hey, I want you guys to join me in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day. Uh, forgive us our sins and hear us today. Father, hear our hearts. God, we, uh, we need you. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place uh, to speak to us. God, I pray that you will soften our hearts so that we will hear you and listen to you, Father. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, so today is week two of our Monsters series, uh, and I started to call this series The Gospel According to Dracula, and you will hear why later, but uh, I wanted to talk to you today about one of the uh, most iconic monsters in, in certainly uh, European and American history. Uh, you guys have grown up watching... Uh, watching films about Dracula and, and, and there's all sorts of stories but, but there is a huge lesson to be learned about this today so stick with me as we walk through this on the computer I am so sorry in advance keep up with me the best you can I finished this at about 4 a.m. last night because uh, there were some things I was like no we gotta change this and so uh, so we did and the, uh, uh, the, the screen will reflect that I changed this at 4 a.m. So you guys keep up with me best you can. But I want to talk to you a little bit about Dracula before we get going. Uh, there, there's a couple things that we all know about him, but let's go through this. I actually was not as familiar with Dracula as I thought I was. Not a big horror movie guy. Let me say something before you start thinking I'm a sissy, okay? It's not because I'm afraid when I watch a horror movie. It's because I don't want to be afraid, okay? I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm not a real jumpy person. The last horror movie I saw was the remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and and at that time I'm in my young 20s, and I'm going to bed like looking under my bed, and I thought, this is making a sissy out of me. I'm, no more. No more of this. I hated that. I hated feeling like that, looking under my car and all that stuff. I hated it. So I, I, I'm not familiar with this, and I've been educating myself on Dracula, and there's some stuff I did not know. So when I say we all know this, I didn't know some of this, but let's walk through this. Dracula was a vampire. Uh, so a vampire is walking dead, right? I've heard that somewhere before. Walking dead. I should make a show out of that. Patent that. Somebody write that idea down. Uh, so he is the walking dead. Like already dead, but still up. Living Dead, I think we also call that. That's, that's a vampire, okay? Uh, Dracula is overwhelming. He is as strong as 20 men, some said. Dracula is rich. He has a lot to offer. He has a lot, I mean, the dude's hundreds of years old. And he's accumulated some things. He's a count. Dracula can summon people to himself. He could just use, I guess, his frontal lobe, his dead half of his brain that he can use that we can't, I don't know, and he would summon people to himself. Women would just show up to be a victim because he just called them to himself. Dracula was, was, he, he was too difficult to defeat. You could stab him, you could shoot him, you could throw him off of something, and it wouldn't kill him. It seemed like he was indestructible. Dracula, I, now this is the part that I did not know, okay? He worked best on his own turf. I don't know if you guys uh, heard about this, but in his coffin is soil from his native land, because if he leaves his native land. Did you guys know this? It drains his power. So if he goes somewhere else, so in the original, uh, Bram Stoker, is that the guy who wrote Dracula? In, in the original, when he travels from Hungary to England, he's got to take coffins full of his native soil because he works best on his own turf and he loses power when he's not on his own soil. I didn't know that one, okay? He's a, a shapeshifter. Did I say that right? I said that right, okay? The dude can turn into a bat. If I got to pick a superpower, that wouldn't be it. I'm just throwing that one out there. I'm not really sure how that's helpful. But I'm sure at some point, it's cool to be able to turn into a bat. All right? Dracula, 
can turn people into something like him. Nobody comes to Dracula and turns him back into a human, but Dracula turns everybody else into a vampire. That one's going to play important later. All right? Dracula has no life of his own. He's the walking dead. He only steals life. Does everybody know all of those things? Anybody in here a Dracula buff and you knew all of those? I see a couple heads shaking. You guys are sick. Okay? I didn't know all of those. I'm just now, uh, I'm just now taking this in. But as, as I read through this, and, and we go through these attributes of Count Dracula, does that sound like anybody? When you, when you listen to that, you go, you know, he seems like he's too strong to defeat. You can't, like, if I could just go stab him with a knife and kill him, I would, but I can't kill him. He just, it's like he, he, he hones me in, tractor beam, suck me right in. Anybody? Nothing. All right. Who does that sound like? Do you guys know what Dracula means, what that translates to in English? Anybody know this one? I think I found something that Belinda doesn't know. She's like my Dracula buff over here. <laughs> Means devil. Sounds just like him, doesn't it? It sounds just like the devil. Now, when I go back through this, Satan is the walking dead. <laughs> His fate is sealed. He's overwhelming. It seems like you can't defeat him. He's really rich and has a lot to offer, so to speak. It's almost like he can call people to himself. He's stronger than any man, can do what we can't. He works best on his own turf, can I get an amen? He is a shapeshifter. He doesn't always come as an ugly vampire with huge teeth. He turns people into something like him, and we never turn him into something like us. And he has no life of his own. He steals life. Doesn't that sound just like Satan? But, some of y'all were surprised I said Satan. I, I, think, I think that I'm right on this. When we go through these attributes of Dracula, Dracula and I said, who does this sound like? Now, I, no, nobody point. I don't need you to say anything. You can agree with me in silence, or you can disagree with me in silence. When I said, who does that sound like? You weren't thinking devil. You were thinking me. Not, not me, the pastor. Like, I'm, okay, you, you guys are dead this morning. Man, thank you for helping last night. You guys, we should have had Red Bull in this joint this morning. So many people are just like, not here this morning, and you guys are here in zombies. Okay, so, <laughs> some of us were thinking, that's a, that. That actually sounds like me. Some of you were thinking, that sounds like my ex-husband. You need to let that go. Let's move on, okay? But some of you were going, that sounds like me. Now, either way, either way, the point is that whether it's Count Dracula or something else, there is a vampire, so to speak, that is after you. So, if we can learn how they killed Dracula, maybe we can learn how to defeat Satan. If I can learn how they killed Dracula, maybe I can figure out how to kill the flesh inside of me that's trying to steal the life that God wants to bring into me. So, how did they kill Count Dracula? The first thing that you need is the same thing that every other superhero needs. They need Wolverine, right? <laughs> Okay, some of you didn't get that joke. So the man who kills Count Dracula is Van Helsing, okay? Now I watched, and I've, I've never done this. You guys don't judge me. I don't do this. This is the first sermon I've ever done this for. Uh, I, I had to watch a movie in preparation for this because I've never watched a Dracula movie. So I watched an old Dracula movie, and I'm not sure, according to that show, how Van Helsing got all of his vampire information, but he was up to snuff on his vampire info, okay? This dude knew a lot about vampires. He knew what he was supposed to do. And so he had kind of a formula. This is how you kill a vampire. And I think he was right. I think he's on to something. So let's see what he does, and maybe we can do the same thing. All right? 
So, let's go through this. Dracula has some weaknesses. Satan has some weaknesses. Your flesh has some weaknesses. And while Dracula was too strong to be killed in the night, if you could exploit his weaknesses, if you could fight him on your turf, you could win. And I want to say the same thing to you today. So as we go through this, there are many of us, and I've been there so many times, and we say there's something inside of my flesh that is pulling me in the wrong direction. There is something that has been plaguing me and I feel like it can never be defeated. I want you to hear a word from the Lord today. Yes, it can. Dracula can be defeated. I know he's the strength of 20 men. I know that you fought this battle before and lost over and over. And many of us have given up. Many of us have something in our life that plagues us. And we say, it's just going to have to remain there. I'm just going to have to cope with it. I'm just going to have to deal with it. And that is not a truth from God. That is a lie from Satan. It seems like it is too much defeat. But in the name of Jesus, and I don't want to be cheesy when I say this, but in the name of Jesus, it can be defeated. Somebody come on. In the name of Jesus, you don't have to have that looming over you. There can be victory from this blood-sucking vampire that's been after you for so long. So let's see how we do that. What were the weaknesses that Dracula had? Dracula had a weakness. First off was the cross. The cross, unleavened bread, holy water, right? These are all things that identify with Christ. Makes you think that the writer of this was a Christian. I don't think that was his intent in writing this story, but man, it works well, okay? Dracula was offended by the cross. Now, it didn't kill him, but he wouldn't come near you. He was offended by the cross. When someone identified with holiness, Dracula had to stay away because he was the epitome of unholy. Okay, He was separated from God in every way, and he couldn't come near those things that identified with holiness. So the cross would stop Dracula. Here was a second one. A wooden stake would kill him. If you could take a wooden stake and drive it through his heart, he was toast. That'll come into play in a minute, okay? The third weakness that he had was light. Now, light did not kill Dracula. Now, there's different versions when there's 752 versions of a story things begin to change. But in its original form, light didn't kill Count Dracula, but it did drain his power. And the fourth thing is this. He needed his own native soil. Again, losing strength when he wasn't fighting on his turf. Okay? Now, again, who does that sound like? Right? So if we want to defeat Count Dracula, if we don't want to defeat Satan, we're going to have to identify with something holy. We're going to have to be holy. We're going to have to be made holy. I'm not talking about wearing a t-shirt that identifies you with Christ. I'm talking about living a lifestyle that identifies you with Christ. Because Satan is deeply offended by the cross. Satan is deeply offended by holy living. Satan will avoid you when you live holy. It may not kill him, but it does offend him and keeps him away, okay? Dracula was killed by a wooden stake. I believe the same thing happened to Satan. Anybody? I believe the same thing happened to Satan. It takes something supernatural to kill something supernatural. You could shoot Dracula all day long. You could stab Dracula all day long, but it did nothing to him. There was something about a wooden stake that would kill him. Now, before I go on, sorry, back there on the computer. Let me back up to the cross. I've skipped a couple of scriptures I think are important. The cross was offensive. I want to give some biblical support to, to, to what I'm saying here. Otherwise, it's all in theory. Matthew 16:24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Why did Jesus tell us to take up our cross? So that we can identify with him. Because he knows that there's an enemy coming after, after us. And if we identify ourselves with Christ, we are off limits 
to Satan. Now, he will try to oppress you, but he will not possess you because you have identified with the cross. Okay, going to the second one. A wooden stake would kill Dracula. The same thing happened to Satan. Check out Ephesians 6, 11, 12, and 17. I love this. ties so well. It just preaches itself. It writes itself. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Check out verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you read through Ephesians, and I hope you'll go home and read Ephesians chapter 6, you will notice that when you put on the armor of God, when you have faith, when you have the sandals of the gospel, when you have all these things, you have all this, and most of it is in defense. Why? Because Dracula is after you. Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. But you have one weapon. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about the... Uh, the the, the clothes spiritually that we're supposed to put on, the armory that we're supposed to put on. But you have one weapon, and that is the Word of God. If you want to defeat Satan, you're going to need your weapon. You're going to need your wooden stick. That is the Word of God. Okay? So we can pray, and we can use the Scripture. That is, both of those, right, are representing the Word of God in our life. You have Satan infiltrating you. And you, I wish I could get rid of this. I wish I could get rid of this. And I, 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 I wish there was a more interesting solution that I could give you. I wish there were a, a, a more exciting uh, antidote that I could give you sometimes, but it is as simple as this. Are you in the Word of God? We want a new formula. I've heard that before. Okay, are you doing it? <laughs> or are we doing it? Like, I need to get this out of my life. I need but you don't understand, Pastor. I, I, I'm, I'm not really a reader. No, you don't understand. This isn't a normal book. You don't understand. This is something supernatural. Right. This was written by God Himself, the God who is still living, the God who, who has manifest Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I, I shouldn't do this. They're equal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's manifest Himself in that way. And the Holy Spirit will continue to read to you as you read it. You say, I'm not really a good reader. It doesn't matter. He is and He will teach you. Hey. Well, I've read it before and that didn't happen. Ho, ho, ho. Try this. Don't be in a rush. Get on your knees and pray and ask God to speak to you. <laughs> Open your Bible up to the book of John and begin to read. And I don't care how much you read. Read until you get something. And then pray until you pray. What does that mean? You know the difference. Sometimes we pray, and sometimes we pray. Right. But there's a difference. It has nothing to do with time. It has everything to do with the presence. Read until you've read. Pray until you've prayed. I don't know how much time that takes. Don't be in a hurry. Allow the Holy Spirit to move. You have a wooden stake to kill Dracula. And sometimes, and I'm not, I'm not knocking the morning the devotional verse on your phone. Uh, I, I'm not knocking that at all. I think that's great. My wife does that. Uh, that. That's not all she does, but she does that. She gets a lot out of it. But sometimes, man, one one verse is kind of like getting God off your conscience instead of putting God in your life. Does that make sense? Okay. Read until you've read. Pray until you've prayed. You have a wooden stake to defeat Dracula. It's been there all along. We want a different answer. Okay. There's not one. The light would drain Satan. Check out John chapter 8. Uh, I'm sorry, Dracula. Check out John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 1, verse 5 says this. The light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus is the light. And so Satan works best in the dark, right? Remember, Dracula had his powers drained in the light. Some of you will, some of you have told me this uh, and in fact a lot of you have told me this. You say, hey, Sunday morning it's just one hour but it's the best hour of my week. I can't wait. All week. And, 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 and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Man, thank God that, that he uses me but it has nothing to do with me. It's because you walked into the light and you've escaped the torment for an hour. Do you realize that the light is not just in here? 
I know that you guys know this because we say it all the time, but do y'all know that this is the Ranger Academy of Martial Arts? This is a dojo. You are the church. The light is with the church because we have Christ. He is the light of the world. And not only does this not have to be the only hour that you have the light, but God will be the light through you. And people will come to you and say, whenever I get to talk to you at work, that's the best hour of my day. Why? Because they get to escape the torment. Because they go into the light for an hour. Because you are the light of Jesus. And Satan is drained of power when he gets into the light. This preaches itself. I love it. You can be the light. Okay, now, the other thing, and, and this is big. This is big. Dracula needed his own soil. He needed his native land. Now, the version of Dracula I watched was with, I, I'm running on very little sleep, so memory recall's not coming to me. Uh, Who's the guy that did the one-arm push-ups? The old man, the old Spice commercial guy. Thank you. Okay, uh, that guy. <laughs> I've already for forgot it again. Jack. Yeah, he. Uh, Jack Palance. Palance. Is that? Did I say it right? Lelaine. Lelaine. Jack Lelaine. Yes, Palance. We're right. You guys are talking about a different one-arm push-up guy. I think two guys have done that in history. Okay, anyways, I watched his version of Dracula, and, and, and I got this. And at the end of the movie, the people came into his castle because he had gone from Hungary to England. And so he had to have all these caskets with his soul, and they burned him. So he had to go back home. Ooh, think about that. They burned him, so he had to go back home. Why? Because he's drained of power. And so they go into his castle to kill him, and Dracula walks into the room, and he's excited. Why? He said, you're on my turf now because he's strong. When he's on his turf. So don't fight Dracula in his castle. That's his turf. He gets strength from there. If you're single in here, don't find a partner on his turf. If, if that makes sense. Maybe that helps. Maybe it doesn't. You're struggling with something that's been plaguing you. Where is it its strongest? Don't go there. Dracula needed his turf. Check out 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? In the same way Van Helsing defeated Count Dracula, you can defeat Satan. Now listen, sometimes it's not Satan. And, and, and like I said earlier, we went through that and we said, that's not Satan, that was actually me. Oh, okay, let's go back through these really quickly. Uh, the cross, <laughs> the wooden stake, uh, the light, this turf, same thing. Fill yourself with the presence of the Holy Spirit, with holiness. Take the Word of God as the wooden stake, because sometimes it's not, it's, it's, it's not Satan. Now, I mean, it is. I mean, he obviously influences us, but like I said, we, we have the Medea complex going like, I can be bad all by myself. I don't even need Satan to do that, okay? You've got some stuff in your life that you need to put a wooden stake through. You know what I'm saying? We need to take the Word of God and let that convict us and say, no, 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 this has to go. While it is in the daytime sleeping in its coffin, I've got to take a wooden stake and I've got to pour that out. While that thing is sleeping in its coffin, I've got to take a wooden stake and I've got to delete that. While it's sleeping in its coffin, I've got to take a wooden stake and text the breakup message. While it's sleeping in its coffin, I've got to take a wooden stake and say, we're getting out of here. Whatever it is, live holy. Kill the abomination. Walk in the light. And be careful where you go. Be careful where you go. Okay, let's move on. This is all in theory. Because it's all Dracula. Dracula wasn't ever meant to be preached that I know of, although it should have been. Is this actually in the Bible? Go with me to John chapter 13, verse 21 through 30. I'm going to have to catch you up on what we're jumping into. But John 13, 21 through 30, full disclosure, I was tired this morning. This was the only shirt that didn't need ironed, and it was a bad choice. I am burning up up here, okay? So, all right. John chapter 
13, 21 to 30. If you guys don't know where John is, you didn't bring your Bible, you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the back. We would love for you to take one. Not a burden for us. We've given away hundreds since we've been in Ranger, and we love to do that. So please take one. Uh, but the, the scriptures will all be on the screen this morning, so don't worry. We didn't expect anyone to walk in here as a Bible scholar. In fact, if you're not familiar with the Bible, it's in two sections, Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is a record of God choosing His people, promising that one day a, a, a Messiah, a Savior, the Christ would come. And then when that Christ comes, that's Jesus. Thank you, brother. That's Jesus, and that starts the New Testament. So we are in the New Testament today, and in fact, we're talking about Jesus and one of His followers this morning. You guys know that there were 12 men that Jesus selected to follow Him. Jesus started his ministry when he was 30 years old, and he died at 33. So he, he begins to gather disciples at 30 years old, and he, he walks with them. For the, I mean, they live together, eat together, sleep together, everything together, right? And he took 12 men. Now, he knew the entire time that one of those men was a devil. That's what he said. One of you is a devil. They didn't understand what he was talking about. He's like, we all have sacrificed everything to walk with you, right? Not one of us is a devil. What does he mean by this? Jesus is always speaking in parables. We have no idea what he's talking about. But Jesus knew that somebody was going to be trained. Yet, the entire time, he still disciples them. Mm, that's a whole other sermon think about that. Now, Jesus invests three years into the man that we now know of as Judas Iscariot. Now, there were two of the twelve apostles that were named Judas, so I will call him Judas Iscariot, okay? Judas Iscariot walked with Jesus uh, all this time. He had seen the power of Jesus. And I wonder, I, I can't back this up scripturally, but I'm just going to walk out on a limb here and say that Judas had probably been used by God to do some miraculous things. We see some other people who uh, weren't necessarily followers who were used right in the hand of God to, to, to do some pretty incredible things. But, but Judas walks with Jesus. He sees everything that he's done. And now Jesus is coming to the end. He knows it's almost over and he has a Passover meal. So he goes into an upper room. He washes the feet of all his disciples, all his disciples. That means the man who is about to betray his life, 30 pieces of silver, right before he does it, hours, hours before Jesus knows he's going to turn him in to die a horrific death, Jesus washes his feet. Hmm, man. Live like that. Sometimes people say that you know, Christians are passive or Christians are cowardly. If it's cowardly, then why is it so hard to do? Man, washing the feet of the guy who's about to turn you in. All Jesus ever did was take care of him, teach him, show him life. Washed his feet and he's about to turn him in to die. I'm, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, here we go. Jesus treats Judas like all the rest. And then here we come into John chapter 13. They're in the upper room. They're having the Last Supper. Judas is about to uh, turn Jesus in. And, and this is where we catch in on the story. Verse 21, here we go. When Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. That's John, by the way, the one Jesus loved. He loved them all. But John wrote this book and he calls himself the one Jesus loved. If I wrote a book, I'd say the same thing. Verse 24, Simon Peter motioned to him. Simon looks at John and goes, right? I'm pretty sure that's biblically accurate. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, he's the one I will give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. After Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to him. I still don't get that verse. How did they not get it? He just said, I'll tell you who will betray me. I'm about to hand him some bread. And he handed him some bread and said, go do it quickly. And the guy walks out and does it quickly and they're still confused. I don't know. I don't know. Alright? None of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to him since we... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. After receiving the piece of bread, he immediately left, and it was night. 
Now, this is the part where Judas comes to the compilation. He's had three years to decide what he was going to do. He's watched Jesus perform all of these miracles. He's followed Jesus. He's probably taught about Jesus. We know that, we know that he was probably... He, uh, it, we're fairly certain he was sent out with a 72 that went out and ministered two by two. Judas was in the mix of all of this compilation of three years. It all comes to this zenith, and he's got to choose. Am I going to follow Jesus, or am I going to follow Satan? And right there in the room with Jesus, Satan, like Dracula, beckons him out. And as soon as he chose, the Bible said that Satan entered into him. And he went out and catch this part. And it was night. Dun, dun, dun. Look at the imagery here. Look at Dracula here. Satan is calling him out. So Dracula would stand outside of a house and he would just call out a woman using his, his brain and she would come out and then become a victim to Dracula and we're like dude I've been that chick in the horror films I've done that not knowing why I'll just walk out of the house like I know this ain't good but I gotta go something's calling me to it and we've done that over and over and it's like it's like he sucks us in it's like he, he calls us to himself and we just we just go and, and, and Judas did this but he had had three years to decide God says in, in Romans chapter 1, I don't, I don't have this on the computer, guys. It's just kind of coming out. John, God says in Romans chapter 1 that, that every man is without excuse to know Jesus because of the way that he has set the world up, right? I mean, we've all been able to look at creation. We've all been able to see what God has done. And then the Bible says that when, when a man rejects God for so long, God gives him over to a reprobate mind. And I think that's what we're talking about here because Judas gets to the end of three years and it's time for him to decide. And he chooses Satan. Boom! Satan enters into him. Now, I don't get all the theology behind this. I don't know if Satan couldn't enter into him before that. I don't know if Judas wouldn't allow him because he's still, he's, he's still wondering, who am I going to follow? Who am I going to choose? But we know that as soon as he says yes, boom, Dracula comes and turns him into a vampire. Now, I know this is not common theology, but I think that I'm biblically accurate and we can have this conversation but you better be loaded with scripture because I am we have this assumption that I get to have the rest of my life I mean maybe maybe someday on my deathbed I'll choose to follow Christ I, I, I get the rest of my life God says in Romans 1 that men are given over to a reprobate mind. So sometimes, man, we walk and we walk and, and we deny God, we deny God, we deny God, and God goes, okay. Right. Can you come back from that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, let's say you can, will you? Once you've been given over? And doesn't that explain so much? We see stuff in the news. How could a man get there? How could your mind go there? I mean, look at sex trafficking. It's just thousands and thousands of women, and they're being used by so many men, and you're going, who would use this victim? How many thousands of men are doing this? I mean, in our own Super Bowl in the United States, how many people are, are, are trafficked in as sex slaves, and these men are using them? We go, you sick sucker. How can you do this? How can your mind get there? And then we think back in our own lives and go, ooh, yeah. I'm that person. I've done some horrible, horrible things, right? Because I, I, I was so distant from God. And when, when we become distant from God, man, where your mind can go. So we push God off. I'll get there later. I'll get there later. I'll get there later. I wouldn't do it. Can you come back from that? Maybe. Don't try to find out. I got really distracted. Where are we? Judas failed to kill Dracula and then became like him. He hid for three years in the presence of Jesus. Have you ever hid in church before? <laughs> I have. And we've got stuff and we have, man, we have all these, all these things that we know God wants us to get rid of, but God, I went to church, man, I paid my dues. No, nah, that's just hiding. Follow him. Be obedient to him. Judas never makes it to the cross. Do you understand that Judas hangs himself? 
before he ever gets to the cross. He never gets to experience the power of the cross. He never gets to receive the Holy Spirit because Satan made him just like himself. And before he could ever get there, he hangs himself. Judas had something that he wouldn't drive a wooden peg through. Now, the part of what I didn't tell you is that Judas, and you read there, was the keeper of the money. So the twelve would travel around. I mean, they still had to pay taxes. They still had to eat. So they had money. And they had a money bag. And Judas was the keeper of the money bag. And the Bible says that Judas would often steal from the money bag. Don't you know he was convicted? He stole money from Jesus. Like, you wouldn't take money out of an offering plate when it's going around in the dojo. But you're taking out of Jesus... The son of Mary, like literally in flesh right there, you're stealing his money. There's got to be some conviction in that. There's got to be a loss of sleep in that. And he wouldn't kill it. He wouldn't kill it the whole time. He's in the presence of Jesus, but Dracula's standing outside going, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And he wouldn't kill it. You got stuff that you got to kill. Why? Because Satan works best on his own soil. And so Judas is, is in the presence of Jesus in the day, but when nobody's looking, he's sleeping in his coffin full of soil from his native land. You guys picking up what I'm laying down? You smell what I'm stepping in here? We keep that soil in there. We keep something from our past. Man, we, we, we're not willing to kill the flesh. And so we keep it around just in case we might need that someday. And God is saying, sacrifice it. Become something that I am. Not like something that He is. See, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy Dracula. But Jesus comes to give life and give life more abundantly. Hey. And so the world is preaching, and man, I hear so many sermons about, oh, everything is okay, and we talk about grace, and yes, grace is there, but, but the grace to forgive us for what we've done and give us the chance to, to sacrifice the things that are keeping us down, the chance to kill Dracula as he tries to pull us out. That's what grace is doing. I'm not saying you're going to earn your salvation, but I am saying that there's going to be a measure of obedience that Jesus requires from a follower. Right? Like if you're not following, you're not a follower. <laughs> Don't be confused on that part. He slept in his native soil. I want the worship team to go ahead and come up. I, I've got to be done right here. But just a couple key thoughts that, that I, I, I want to bring out. Are you carrying your cross? Because every time that Van Helsing had a counter, encounter with Dracula, he was ready. He kept a bag with him at all times. He had a cross in there, ready. Are you carrying your cross? Are you identifying with Jesus through holy living, or do you look like Dracula? Am I able to tell, in, 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 at night, at a party, were they able to tell the difference between Dracula and somebody else? Right? Are you living holy? Are you willing to kill the things that are vampires in your life? Can you take the wooden stake, go in the daylight, and drive it through the heart of Dracula? It's hard. In, in, in the movie, alluding back to this again, Dracula would turn someone's loved one into a vampire. And then they would have to go and murder them in the day. And they would, they, they would, they, they would cry, they would weep as they had to do it because it was something very emotional. Man, that'll preach. There's some stuff that's an emotional tie. Listen, there's a lot of things that I'm not talking about right now. If you're struggling with your marriage, I'm not talking about go get divorced right now. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about sins that we're holding on to that we won't give to Jesus. We've got to be ready to kill those. Stop running into the darkness. We go to church, it feels good, but then when it really hits the fan, where do you run to? When it really goes down in life, where do you go for shelter? And most of us can say, I'll admit to you now that I'll run back to the darkness. My default is to run into the darkness. Run to the light. Jesus is asking you to be a new creation and to leave our native soil our sinful lifestyle. Do you have something 
holding you back. He says that you'll be the light. You believe Jesus when he says that you will overcome the world, that you will become the light, that you will be the city on the hill. You will be a beacon. We feel like we are the vampire. We are the darkness. We are the minion that Dracula called out. And Jesus has called you to be something completely different. I'll end with James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want to pray and uh, we're, we're going to pray and these guys are, uh, they're going to play and when they do, some baskets are going to come forward. We, we, we don't roll that way. We don't give anybody the shakedown, okay? Uh, but if you are a believer in this place, part of the way that we worship is through our tithing offering. So you can do that here or, or online at www.thewoodbridgechurch.com. Um, also, if you have anything you'd like to communicate with us, please take that connection card, fill it out, put it in the basket, and we would love to give you a call, text, something this week. But I just want to leave you with a last thought. Have you ever met Dracula? Because one thing we know of Dracula is he doesn't go away unless the experts are called in and somebody goes hunting. Do you believe that God can kill the blood-sucking vampire in your life and give you victory? I'm not talking about week by week victory. I'm talking about lifelong victory over your vampire. He will. You guys, everybody, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to join me as we do this. Uh, but if you guys would just bow in the spirit of prayer. We rarely ever do this. Uh, but, but I just want to lead you guys. And if you follow me in this, I really want you to communicate this with me later. Nobody's obviously going to check in on you. Uh, there's nobody to report uh, numbers to. Hey, this many people raise their hands. So you guys don't worry about any pressure on this. But with everybody, you know, just not looking around. Uh, we don't want to embarrass anybody. If you can tell me this morning, I have a vampire in my life and I've got to get it out because it keeps drawing me into the darkness and I feel like I can't get victory. Would you just slip your hand up so that we can see that? You feel like you are not able to, to receive victory over this. It is continually pursuing me and calling me out. You guys can put your hands down. I saw a lot of hands come up. Guys, we assumed that. Satan is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. I want you guys to know if you slipped your hand up or maybe you did it, but you wanted to. If you will call on the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I want you guys to call on the name of Jesus. You say, well, I'm shy. Okay, it's, it, it, it's time to get over that and find somebody. When service is over, the worship team will be up here. I'll be up here. We want you to come pray with us. You have a friend in this church. Maybe there's somebody who invited you to come today. I want you to get with them and, and, and call on the name of Jesus and have a witness so that when Satan tells you later, no, 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 you're still mine, you can say, no, I'm not, and I've got a witness. I've got somebody that heard me. Call upon a Savior. I'm not going to give you a formula of how to do that today, but I want you to do it. Please let us know. You guys pray with me, Jesus. We call on you. We need you. We need a Savior. We need you to kill Dracula. Father, we need you to bring us out of the darkness and into the light. You said in your word, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We're ready to give it a shot. We've been a thousand elsewhere. We long for just one day in your court, Father. Bring us into your presence. 
Thank you for victory, God. Thank you. You you beat him. You, you defeated Dracula. You defeated Satan. You've defeated my flesh. We praise you for that, Father. And I pray that you would just spread that victory into this place, into this room right now, Father. I, pr I pray, Holy Spirit, just, just anoint this place with a spirit of victory. There are so many people who think that there is something in their life that they will never get rid of, Father. I just pray, Lord, we, we, we honor you and we worship you in, in truth, but we want to worship you in spirit right now. So, Spirit, I ask you to sweep through so that we can feel it God I want to feel it the victory Father just bring that into our hearts we love you God we praise you for the victory I praise you because somebody in here today has chosen victory and they're going to live in it for the rest of their lives and they're going to bring people into it the credit is yours the glory is yours Lord in Jesus name we pray